Ah, super hero movies. Films like the Marvel and DC Comics films never fail to empower people to be heroes and create a superhero fantasy. It would be no surprise that Sesame Street level copied that trend long before it was popular. So when you combine these two genres together, Sesame Street live in superhero culture, you get Super Grover ready for action. This was my first Sesame Street Live show in 2012, and I had fond memories of them actually using the video screen on the lamp since that was a thing I was obsessed with when I found out that would be the show I was going to. The show was the first to have 13 required performers and marks the disciplines of the walkway stage. The show was also written by Joey Mezzarino, who is best known for the role of Murray Monster, but he also played other characters such as Lightning, Mare, Horatio the Elephant, and so on and so forth. He also wrote many of the school skits, word on the street segments, and many episodes of Sesame Street. The show I saw was Super Grover Ready for Action, but it went under the title of Elmo Super Heroes Just to Boost Ticket Sales. And I have nothing against Elmo, but the fact that they took the only show named after Grover named it to an Elmo show was just demeaning. But it's not demeaning of puffing a popular character on the cover of promotional photos, which is just an understanding. But that's not the case for the show, because Zoe has a speaking role in this one. Why? Because of Rocco. Rocco is Zoe's pet rock whom Stemmo claims is not alive, which becomes a pretty good running gap throughout the show. But nonetheless, Abby could Abby replace Rosita, I mean, much of the fantastic of Rosita takes Baby Bear's place. Prairie Dawn, everyone's favorite BRB, had a speaking role in the 2005 original, but was demoted to an understudy in 2008, replacing Roxy Marie. But for this review, I will be highlighting the parts where she spoke to because I'm a theater kid. Which is a good time to talk about understudies. The residents Roxy Marie, Grunge Tran and Purple Hector were all understudies. Although I think Franco made a secret Roxy Marie comeback in vocals for doing the pigeon. Or it's just a Mandela effect where Cal, Baby Bear, and Big Bird singing together. Anyways, as the show starts, wait, before the show starts, a character comes out. Most presumably Bird. He has to find a seat before the show starts while Ernie persuades him to be in the show. Bert refuses until Ernie says that they'll do the old meal picture paper flip down, in which Bert starts to sing about it until Harry Dawn comes out and stalks them, letting them know Big Bird starts the show. Bert leaves the show and Harry counts down to the start of the show. Big Bird then comes out and sings the opening number, Somebody Come and Play, which brings out all of the characters one by one. Elmo then breaks the fourth wall by letting them know all the characters did the work to prepare for the visit. And I'm literally impressed that Rocco was able to program all the lights, because that's a pretty hard task coming from a lighting person. As the song ends, Prairie Dawn lets everyone know it's time for the letter and number of the day. Cow says the one, which would play an important part later on. Prairie Dawn impatiently asks if anyone brought the letter of the day. Telly then says he invited the letter K. But it turns out that K is the token human of the show. Telly realizes that he made a common mistake. To fix it, K then makes the letter K with her two arms. Zoe then remarks how Rocco appreciates his letters to Elmo's and Owens. But then, Super Grover flies in. That's one of the two times Super Grover flies in the show. Super Grover then states he lost his supers and somebody else has to fill them. After Elmo and Abby start parodying Footloose, K then suggests that they fill it. As they change into the superhero outfits, K, Bert, Ernie, Cookie, Count, I mean Rosita, Big Bird, and Prairie Dawn invite the audience to war with them. And then they finish the Footloose parody. Elmo becomes Captain Fuzzy, Abby is Glittercook, Zoe and Rock go becoming Wonder Zoe and Rock Rack, again to Elmo's noise, and tell you the Triangle Joy. As they wait for the big cheese to call, they take the opportunity to parody a chorus line if I hope he calls us. The first mission was to help Old McDonald find for lunch. This is a weird line to take out of context. Old McDonald is actually K in disguise, probably testy. Of course, they give her her tuna fish sandwich, milk and an apple, cookie monster. She has a cookie, but she explains that it's a sometimes food. Cookie then states his word, doesn't make sense anymore, then leaving Cookie Monster left sushi and some rivers. Super Grover then sings a sad song about how being a superhero is important to him. Back at headquarters, Abby states being a superhero is too much work, so they decide to take turns, in which the next mission is in Journey Turn. At least I knew instead of them just jump scare and Big Bird. Big Bird then enters saying that he's too tired to find Ernie, and then Abby, I mean Little Girl appears. She plays loud music to try and wake up Big Bird, but then Kay comes in obviously tired too, and tells Abby all about sleep. 
Twinkle Little Star, and Pitbull gets an idea where Lenny may be. As Lenny sings, I don't want to live on the moon. Big Bird envies to find Ernie after he gets his rest. Because I don't want to live on the moon. Big Bird envies to find Ernie after he gets his rest. Because I don't think anyone wants to sit at a show for more than eight hours. Grover then realizes his helmet is the reason that his superness is gone. Rosita then suggests that he finds a new cape with an impromptu cape fashion show with Bird, Ernie, Prairie Dawn, and the original and Cookie. Although it would have been interesting if Count was part of the fashion show since he has a cape already. Grover then chooses Cookie Monster's tropical cape designed by KKMY. But then he realizes his cape is not the problem. Kate then goes back to TH drawing board. Now it's Elmo's world that's in danger. Elmo feels hopeless. Kate gives him motivation to save Elmo's world along with Big Bird, Bird, Cookie, Bird, Count, Prairie Dog, and the company. Elmo then wonders what could be wrong with Elmo's world. The answer comes after intermission. Here's a poem for you, by the way. Roses are red. You are real neat. Please put that ten-dollar Elmo balloon underneath your seat. The show starts again in three minutes. <laughs> and it's the time again on Sesame Street for All Stars World, the classic 1998 segment starring Oscar. Featuring Gene and Mudfish, and Mr. Noodle played by Nobody. Oscar tries to educate everyone about hygiene, but is corrected by Elmo. And I have to say, Kerry Clash and Carol Skinny have an amazing dynamic in the scene where Oscar is the grouchy one trying to combat Elmo's positivity. Oscar then gives up as Elmo claims what was once his, Elmo's world. Grover then heads to Bird to help him find his suits. Bird then teaches Grover how to fly like a pigeon, which also fails. The Big Cheese then tells everyone that the letter of the day has trouble now. So who's going next? They decide by playing rock paper scissors. Rocko whips, of course, because he is rock and rock beat scissors. This again frustrates Elmo because, well, and what's the trouble in the letter of the day? Did they change the song? Did they keep referring to the sponsors? No. Cookie Monster ate all the letter-based cookies. So he then educates him all cookies being a sometimes cool. Prairie then comes in with a cart of fruit and veggies. Cookie then wraps the healthy food along with Prairie and Zoe. Prairie then lets Cookie know that he ate everything from the fruit stand. Cookie Monster then bends for more leaves with Prairie Gorn. The number of the day is the last segment in danger. Until he is the only one left who hasn't had a turn. So he heads for the number of the day gym, where they only do one of everything. Telly has no idea what to do so he calls for Kate's assistance. Kate then tells Telly that she has nothing except the number zero. With that, the number becomes 10, and then everything is fine. Until we realize Super Grover went for Grover and gave up on his suits. Usually there are Sesame Street live shows where Super Grover is only in one scene and for the rest of the show it's just Grover. Anyways, the fabulous five fight over what Grover needs the most. Kate then reminds them they're a team, and that he needs all of it. Grover then comes back to full power and sings James Brown. After that, they decide to parody footage one more time by showing Super Grover flying. By far, this is the coolest effect Sesame Street Live has ever done. And after that, the cast says their goodbyes and confetti launches. That's pretty much the end. Overall, it was a super comedic Sesame Street Live. And by far the funniest. I like that the show had a Grover-based storyline as opposed to a Elmo-based storyline. The revival was pretty accurate to the 2005 original. More rapier than some other shows. Also, I like how Rocko appears in the show since Elmo getting tipped off by a nominated rack is the latest craze of the internet now. The only thing I would do if it was a 17 cast show is that I would keep Rosita and Baby Bear's spot and Prairie Dong in her original spot with Abby taking Rosita's original lines. With Grunge being small understudy and two honkers being the medium and tall understudies. The show is a 10 out of 10 and is the first in my top 10 Sesame Street lid list. Especially considering it's a 14 cast show, why 14? I'll give you a hint, it features a rock.